Hello and welcome to another Royal Society Publishing video podcast. Today I'm here with Richard Miller and Stephen Sorrell who recently guest edited an issue of Phil Transe on the future supply of oil. How did the special issue come about and what are its major themes? Well, the, it's split into two parts really. The, the first part is about various issues regarding the depletion of what we call conventional oil resources. So there's an introductory paper which sets the scene the concepts, the definitions, the evidence, the issues and so on. Uh, and then five papers look at particular things like uh, forecasts of future global oil supply, the estimates of the rate at which supply is declining uh, from existing fields, uh, the scale of uh, unconventional oil resources uh, and so on. So it's sort of various aspects of the debate about depletion of oil. And then the second half is about what one can do about this. Can you explain the concept of peak oil? Uh, conventional oil is a finite resource and so it is inevitable if you are consuming a finite resource that your rate at which you consume it must at some point reach a maximum and then fall away. And that event in uh, the, the oil business is called peak oil. It's important to realise that the, the quantity that you have underground is not necessarily a guide to being able to get it out at any rate that you want or at a price that you're prepared to pay. And it's not really the timing of the peak that matters, it's the fact that it will come, it has to come, and, and we need to, to deal with it while we still have time to do so. And I think one of the issues is that if you're seeking to explain the history of oil production and then forecast the future of oil production, there's various factors which are influencing that. There's the geology, it's the scale of the resources, the technology that you're using to extract it and whether that can be improved uh, in the future. So there's all the economic incentives on the companies involved and the oil prices and there's political factors and, and geopolitics uh, and so on and people have approached this subject from particular backgrounds whether geologists or economists and focused on those issues and variables which they know best and understand best uh, and have tended to, to neglect others. Uh, so, I mean, put it in rather crude terms, we've had a debate between geological pessimists and uh, economic optimists. How do we estimate current oil reserves and predict future supply? Predicting is perhaps not the best word. I mean, forecasting would be better. But I think we, we should have some humility in our ability to forecast future oil supply and demand because the because of the complexities of, of factors which influence um, supply and demand. Really the only way to prove oil reserves is, is with a drill. You actually have to go and, and find them. If you're in an area which is fairly well explored, you can then extrapolate to what else might be down there that you haven't yet found. And in parts of the world which are not explored, you really have to go by geological analogy with places that you know rather better. But it isn't about the amount that's in the ground at the moment. It's the rate at which you can get it out that matters. Um, the, the phrase is, it's not the size of the tank that matters, it's the size of the tap. And this is all about oil field behaviour. Uh, when you produce an oil field, when you first bring it on stream, you tend to get a rapid build-up to a, a peak level, to a, which you can, can hold at a plateau for several years, and then it starts to fall. And it falls because the, the pressure in the field is dropping all the time that you're producing oil. Later in its life, you'll also start producing water and gas, and of course every barrel of water you produce is a barrel of oil that you're not producing. So inevitably, field output starts to decline. And this happens quite quickly and long before a field has produced even a half of its oil. So most of the life of an active oil field is spent in a state of decline, and that's when it is producing most of its reserves. And that's the state of most of the world's oil fields today. They have a lot of reserves in the ground, but the rate at which it comes out is falling every year. And, and that is what is, <laughs> well, driving peak oil, if you like. If you want to replace that lost production year by year, you have to bring new sources of oil on stream. I think just to add to that, I mean, there is a basic mechanism uh, underlying this notion of, of peak oil, which, which is the physical nature of the oil resource conventional oil I'm talking about, it is located in discrete fields in a limited number of locations around the world. Uh, and it tends to be concentrated in a small number of very large 
fields. Giant fields are often called as supergiant fields. Uh, and by their nature, they tend to be found and exploited first. I mean, if you were just drilling randomly, you'd tend to hit the, the big fields first. Um, so what that means is that um, over time, we need to, production needs to shift to smaller, smaller fields, often in more difficult locations, uh, to compensate for the decline in production from those large fields that were, were developed first. And that becomes progressively more, more difficult. You're sort of running faster to, to stand still. Uh, hence, ultimately, uh, production from a region will, will, will begin to decline. Are there any specific examples, politically, geographically, economically, of issues that influence um, supply? We, we have what we call the below ground factors and the above ground factors. And, and essentially the below ground factors are where is the oil, how, how is it held within the rocks, how technologically difficult is it to, to move it and to, to get it out. The above ground factors are the ones that you're, you're considering there. And they're the ones that say, can we actually go somewhere and explore and produce oil? So for example, um, it is very difficult to go and explore in the Middle East because the, the countries of the Middle East you know, the OPEC states there, wish to have in, uh, their own control of their own resources. And, you know, that seems perfectly natural, but it does mean that those areas are not uh, accessible to the, uh, the Western oil industry. Then again, some places are difficult to explore or to, to produce from because of a particular geography. For example, we're starting to explore off the Arctic shores um, of Russia, and one can think of places in Alaska which have required um, huge uh, engineering problems to be resolved. And the east coast of Canada, where the, the seas are really quite um, serious and, and full of ice, icebergs and ice flows, where you have to have extremely uh, robust and resilient uh, platforms and equipment. Other above ground factors would include, is there an infrastructure? Uh, if you are a country like Angola, you would like to employ your own um, staff to run facilities out there, so is there a trained workforce and, and do you have uh, an existing infrastructure of manufacturing capability to produce the equipment that you need? Uh, if you don't have any of this stuff in place, then that makes it much more difficult to go and explore somewhere in the first place because it's just adding to your costs at the end of the day. How much of a factor is climate change? We are in a situation at the moment where we can only afford to burn about a third of the fossil fuel reserves that we already have. Now, there's oil and gas and coal put together. It is doubtful that even if we didn't burn any coal at all, that we could afford, for climatic reasons, to burn all the oil reserves that we already have. Current understanding of climate change points to the fact that what matters is, is cumulative emissions. It's how much you burn of fossil fuels, not when you burn it, just how much you burn. So um, that means, in order to avoid major temperature increases, a lot of, as Richard said, a lot of the existing resources need to stay in the ground. And these are resources which are on companies' books at the moment. And uh, I don't think the implications of that have uh, fully sunk in. Are there alternatives to conventional oil? The, the alternatives come in almost a pyramid. We have stuff which is uh, very close to what we use today, and these would be what we tend to call drop-in fuels. So the tar sands would be one example. You can make a perfectly acceptable internal combustion engine fuel from the Canadian tar sands, uh, which you can just pour into a car tank, and it's, it's exactly the same. You just drop it in. Producing um, a usable fuel from the bitumen of the Canadian sands is energy intensive. Um, so it does produce more carbon dioxide per barrel at the end of the day as a consequence of that. You can also make drop-in fuels uh, out of, for example, coal or gas. But these require a number of, of chemical conversion steps and every chemical conversion is the consumption of a little bit more energy. So again, these tend to have quite a high um, final carbon dioxide per barrel emission factor. Stepping a little bit further away, you have biofuels which um, are a drop-in in some senses, although you, um, certainly the alcohols do require some change to the engine. But there's a lot of controversy about um, biofuels because they are currently essentially competing for the same food crops that, that people want to eat. There's also the concern that it's not actually making you an energy profit um, when you make this uh, 
when, when you make these biofuels, because the amount of energy required to grow the crops, to process the crops, to transport them to process plants, uh, to finally produce and distribute the fuels, it looks as if you're not, not really um, getting much more out than you put in in the first place. All of them are constrained either in terms of the, their high cost or the environmental impacts. Um, and I think that by far the most promising way of addressing this problem is on the demand side, uh, improving the efficiency with which we use oil, uh, particularly in transport. Trans um, oil use is overwhelmingly uh, concentrated in, in transport and there is huge scope for improving the efficiency of individual vehicles and also shifting modes uh, and reducing the extent to which we move around. What challenges lie ahead for global oil supply, scientifically, economically, politically? The, the scientific issues, if, if you wish to increase the, the liquid fuel supply of the world, in other words, if we're going to ignore the, the climate part of the question, um, then the, the, the scientific problems are how do you get more oil out of, a, out of an oil field? I mean, at the moment, we we tend to leave more than half of the oil behind because it's simply too difficult to get it out. And that presents a very tempting challenge for, for the industry. I think economies facing a number of risks going forward. Um, possible higher oil prices, well, almost certainly higher oil prices and volatile oil prices, which could have quite serious impacts uh, on economies. Uh, and uh, obviously carbon emissions and the consequences of that so I think the political challenge is, is to uh, do things which uh, protect against both those risks, the reduced emissions and also protect economies in terms of their energy security from high oil prices. Thank you both very much and thank you for watching.